we've discussed that EEG data um, contain or can be represented as a sum of, uh, of many sine waves, each sine wave having a different frequency, phase, and amplitude. But we also learn that uh, there are lots of overlapping frequencies in the EEG signal. And so uh, how do we determine what frequencies are present in the signal to what extent? And uh, fortunately, Joseph Fourier gave us the answer to this problem. He gave us a way to address this problem through the uh, Fourier theorem, which states that any signal can be expressed as a combination of different sine waves, each with its own frequency, amplitude, and uh, phase. Uh, we also learned um, how the discrete time Fourier transform works. It works by um, taking the EEG signal, so your data, um, lining up or creating a, a bunch of sine waves that have different frequencies. Um, and of course, as we discussed in the previous lecture, these are complex sine waves, so there's a real part and an imaginary part. Um, and then for each sine wave that's created, you have to compute the dot product, which is the pointwise multiplication between all of the points in the EG data and the sine wave. Uh, and then you sum up all of these points to um, construct a, uh, or to result in a uh, complex dot product from which you can extract uh, amplitude and phase information. Um, and this step is of course repeated for multiple frequencies and this allows you to build up this uh, frequency domain representation of the data. Fair enough, this is all uh, just a bit of quick review. Um, what I'd like to discuss in this video is how exactly we get to units of Hertz. Um, and this is a, an obviously important uh, part of uh, frequency-based analyses, but it's also a bit of a non-trivial uh, part, and it can be a little bit confusing. Because when you looked at the uh, MATLAB code for implementing the Fourier transform, you may have noticed that the time variable, the, the vector that we created for time, was not the same as the time variable that's used to create the original signal. In fact, the, the time variable here goes from 0 to something a little bit less than 1, regardless of what the, uh, what the unit of the original time domain signal was. And in fact, the Fourier transform doesn't even uh, have any representation or inherent sort of um, understanding of, uh, of time or concept of, of time. We just call this variable time. Uh, but the Fourier transform would look exactly the same if this variable were uh, time in milliseconds or time in seconds or time in years, or if it wasn't time at all, if this was um, space, if we were measuring uh, fluctuations in, in, uh, uh, in wave patterns in the ocean and, and our unit was meters. Um, so the Fourier transform is always the same. So the question is, how do we get from this uh, arbitrary unitless vector that just goes from zero to something a little bit less than one? How do we convert those indices to a metric that is more meaningful that we know how to interpret and how to work with, um, which in our case is going to be Hertz for, uh, for uh, brain data analyses? So this is really the, the, one of the main focuses of this lecture. Okay, so our, our good friend Patrick McGowan is back with us, and he asks uh, for a, how many frequencies will you give us from your transform, if we use your transform? Fourier says, well, he wants information, of course, and in return for the information, you get n over 2 plus 1 frequencies. So n is the number of time points that we have in the original time domain signal. And now Fourier says we get n over 2 plus 1 frequencies uh, back when we use his um, transform. So what does this number mean? This may seem like a, a strange or arbitrary number, n over 2 plus 1, where n is the number of time points. So let's take a few minutes to think about what this number might mean and, and why it might make sense. First, we'll think about um, what is the, the highest frequency or the fastest sine wave that we can possibly measure in our data. So if you think about a sine wave that has one cycle, so this is a one cycle sine wave, in order to uh, represent this, this sine wave or measure this sine wave, we need to um, take a theoretical minimum of two data points. So we need at least two 
data points to understand that this is a sine wave. If we only had one data point, uh, then we would have one measurement here and one measurement over here at the next peak. And then we wouldn't be able to determine whether this is a fluctuating pattern or just a straight line because the next measurement would be here. So we need a minimum of two data points per cycle in order to measure a uh, sine wave in order to extract sinusoidal information. So this is the fastest frequency that we can uh, that we can extract out of our data. So having two points or two measurements per cycle corresponds to one half of the sampling rate. Um, so that's that's where we get the fastest frequency in hertz is one half of the sampling rate. This may ring a bell one half the sampling rate. It has a particular name. It's called the Nyquist frequency. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the Nyquist frequency is nothing uh, super sophisticated or complicated. It's just one half of the sampling rate. Okay, so this is the fastest frequency that we can get out of our data. Now let's think at the other extreme. What is the slowest frequency that we can extract out of our data? So we can think about sine waves slowing down. So here's a sine wave with a frequency of 4. It doesn't matter if these are hertz or whatever. These are just uh, numbers. So and then a slower frequency would be 2. Uh, an even slower frequency would be 1. So now we can think even slower. What is the the lowest frequency that we can think of? It turns out it's it's 0, a, a frequency of 0 or a sine wave with uh, with 0 hertz. This may initially seem uh, strange, you know, that there is a sine wave that has uh, zero hertz. But in fact, a, a sine wave with zero hertz is just a flat line, as you can see here. We often call this the DC component, where DC stands for direct current. Uh, this is a term from uh, engineering from electricity, uh, because this is a direct current, and all of these would be examples of alternating currents, or AC. Uh, components. So this lowest frequency that we can possibly extract from the data is called the zero frequency uh, or zero hertz um, or the DC component. This basically captures the mean offset of the data and I will uh, we'll, we'll see how this works in MATLAB in a few minutes. Okay so now we know the two extremes of uh, the frequencies. We get uh, whenever we do a Fourier transform, we always have zero frequency. That's the lowest uh, frequency that, that can be measured uh, or that can be defined even. And then we always have the Nyquist frequency. The Nyquist frequency is defined by the sampling rate. So whatever the sampling rate is, the highest frequency that we can extract from the data is the sampling rate over 2. Okay, so now when we go from something a little bit bigger than zero, to the Nyquist frequency. This gives us our n over 2. And the zero frequency, the DC component, gives us our plus 1. So this is how we get n over 2 plus 1 uh, frequencies from the Fourier transform. So this on, it, on its own may, may seem sensible. Um, but this may also seem inconsistent with what you saw in the implementation of the Fourier transform in MATLAB. And in particular here we saw that the sine waves are not only created up to n over 2 plus 1, the sine waves are created all the way up to n. So here I'm saying that we have n over 2 plus 1 frequencies, but here when you look at the MATLAB code you see we actually get n frequencies. So, uh, so what is up with this? What is the deal with this? So it turns out that things are a little bit more complicated. Uh, and if you have looked at, a, uh, at the result of a Fourier transform, you probably noticed that the um, frequency characteristics or the frequencies don't stop at the Nyquist frequency. They continue going up after or going along after the Nyquist frequency. And if you have a real valued signal, so a signal that only contains real parts and not imaginary numbers, uh, then you would also, or you might also, you might also have noticed that the frequencies uh, past the Nyquist are mirror images. So whatever you see on this side, it's flipped, and you see that on this side. So what's going on with these frequencies that are actually higher than the Nyquist frequency? When I just told you that these frequencies cannot be uh, measured in the signal.
well, maybe you think that these are like the evil frequencies or something. It turns out they're not so bad. We call them the negative frequencies. It's a little bit initially of a strange concept uh, that frequencies can be negative. Uh, but you have to, uh, or you can think about that sine waves have not only frequency and phase and amplitude, but sine waves also have direction. And so the positive frequencies um, correspond to sine waves that go one direction and the negative frequencies correspond to sine waves that go the other direction in, uh, in a polar plane. Now for real valued signals like um, EEG and L LFP and MEG signals, uh, we don't have to really worry about the negative frequencies because the negative frequencies are only different from the positive frequencies if you have a complex signal, if you're taking the Fourier transform of a complex signal, a signal that has a real part and an imaginary part. Uh, but generally in neuroscience, we only start with uh, real valued signals. And so in this case, the negative frequencies simply mirror the positive frequencies. In fact, the amplitudes get split in half between the positive frequencies and the negative frequencies. So to reconstruct the um, amplitudes in your signal, what you have to do is take the negative frequencies or take the amplitudes from the negative frequencies and map those back onto the uh, positive frequencies. In practice, you don't have to do any of this mirroring stuff. You just ignore all the negative frequencies and double all the positive frequencies. So I'll show you how this works in MATLAB in a few minutes. Oh, I'm going to show you very soon. Okay, so now we can uh, switch to MATLAB. Um, so here I've created a signal. This is just some arbitrary random numbers that I just uh, came up with. And here we take the Fourier transform of the signal. And now we're going to plot the signal and its Fourier transform. <clears throat> so here you see the signal. And now you can already see, uh, well, first of all, we don't know what the units are, right? I haven't specified a sampling rate. We don't know if these are measurements in milliseconds or seconds or, or decades. Um, so that means we also don't know what the unit is for the Fourier transform. But what you should see here is that these are um, units and here is, is somewhere in the middle. And now you can see that the positive frequencies and the negative frequencies are mirror image of each other. So what you see going this way is the same as what you see going this way. And the kind of anchor point in the center is the Nyquist frequency. <clears throat> okay, so now what I'm going to do is just also make up a uh, sampling rate. So I just specify that these data were sampled at 100 hertz. That allows us to create a um, or convert these um, indices uh, from from meaningless units into um, into uh, into hertz. And so here we do that. So we we say that there are frequencies between zero and the Nyquist frequency, half the sampling rate, and the number of frequencies that we have in between zero and the Nyquist is uh, n over two plus one. So here is n, the length of our signal, over two, and plus one. And the floor here, that, that means uh, round down, and uh, that's in there just in case the signal is an odd number of, uh, of, uh, of points. Okay, so now you can see in this new figure, now we're able to convert this into hertz. So we know that these are time points in milliseconds. And you can see here, what we saw here is the frequency indices as just the first index, the second index, the third index. Now we are able to convert this into hertz. So this is um, zero hertz, the DC component, and this is 7.1 hertz and 14 point something hertz and, and whatever else it is. Okay, so now I would like to show you the uh, how the, the DC or the zero frequency component fits in here. So here what I'm doing is creating uh, or computing the Fourier transform of this signal three different times. First is the original signal. And then what I do is take the Fourier transform of the signal after subtracting the mean offset. So I'm just, yeah, so here we just compute the mean and then subtract it. And here we compute the mean and then add it. So we're now just going to add some offset to this signal. So first let me um, plot 
just the time domain representations of these signals. So here I just compute the inverse Fourier transform of the signal so we get the, the signal back in the time domain. You can see all three of these versions of the signal look really similar, um, but they're shifted a little bit on the y-axis. So that makes sense. It's the same signal in all three cases. All I've done is subtract the mean or add the mean. Um, so there's just a, a shift in the y-axis. <coughs> Now let's see what happens in the frequency domain. So now you can see the frequency domain representation of all of these, uh, or these three signals. Um, ignore the, the zero frequency for now, we'll get back to that in a second. Um, all of these components uh, have exactly the same um, Fourier coefficients for these three signals, even though they do differ a little bit. And this is actually not just a question of, uh, of scale because if you zoom in, it actually doesn't matter how much you zoom in. These will always be perfectly, perfectly overlapping. And this should actually make sense because the rhythmic components in this signal are exactly the same whether we push the signal up or down on the y-axis. So all of these non-zero frequencies should be exactly the same. The only way that these three uh, versions of this signal differ is in the DC uh, component or the zero frequency component. And here in particular, you can see when we demeaned the signal, when we subtracted the mean of the signal, then uh, the DC component went to zero. So this actually makes a lot of sense. The DC component reflects the mean offset. So we subtract the mean, so we have a zero mean, and then we have a DC of uh, zero. Okay, so I'd like to take this one step further and now instead of adding back the mean, we can add just a number, like let's say uh, 10. So now if we run this cell again, you see, uh, again, these three time series are similar in terms of their fluctuations, uh, but the one that I added 10 to has an offset of 10 now, so that's what I defined. So now in the frequency domain, of course, all these non-zero frequency components are identical. Uh, but the zero frequency component has uh, 20. So this may seem uh, incongruent because you probably expected this to be 10 because the, um, the, the mean offset of this signal is a little bit over 10. It's 10 plus whatever the mean of the signal is. So it should actually be just over 10. So it turns out that I cheated a little bit here. I took a bit of a shortcut here. Um, now, remember I said in the... Uh, in the PowerPoint slide that to accurately estimate the amplitudes from the Fourier transform, you have to fold the negative frequencies back onto the positive frequencies, which you can effectively do just by doubling the um, positive frequencies. So that's what I do here. So it turns out that there's it's a little bit more subtle than this because um, only the non-zero and non-Nyquist frequency components have a corresponding or a complementary negative frequency component. <clears throat> and this should make sense in particular for, um, for zero. There is no negative of zero. Negative zero is zero. So there's no such thing as a negative complement of zero. So in fact, uh, if you want to um, accurately estimate the amplitude of the positive free or of the Fourier transform, you do not simply multiply everything by two, the, the really correct way to do it would be to um, multiply the um, frequency components by two only for the frequency components that are uh, between but not including the DC component, the zero frequency and the Nyquist frequency. So here I'm multiplying all of the, po all of the um, uh, uh, frequencies by two. So this is a little bit of a, of a lazy shortcut but I wanted to have this in here to illustrate uh, how this works. So you can imagine if we would uh, not multiply the, the zero frequency component by two, then this would be something just over 10, which is accurate, that's what it should be. In practice, um, for real EEG data analyses, it's often useful to subtract the mean uh, component because in general, we're not really interested in the mean offset uh, across a larger time series. So in general, you will want to subtract the, the mean uh, from your signal 
before you compute the Fourier transform, kind of like what we do here in version two of this signal. And so in that case, it's kind of, it's okay to, uh, to, to use this lazy shortcut of multiplying everything by two, because if the DC potential is, um, is zero, then two times zero is still zero, so. Okay, so now we see that uh, when we compute a Fourier transform, the frequencies we get are always between zero and the Nyquist frequency. And the Nyquist frequency is defined by half the sampling rate. So the next question is how many points are there between zero and the Nyquist frequency? So this is where the n over two uh, part comes in. So n is the number of uh, data points that you have in your time series. And so the more data points you have in your time series, uh, the more frequencies you will get in between zero and the Nyquist. You will never be able to get higher frequencies than the Nyquist unless you change your sampling rate. But if you have a few data points, you might have a frequency resolution that looks something like this. If you have more data points, you will have a higher resolution. Still, you only get up to the Nyquist frequency, but you have more data points before the Nyquist frequency. Um, and then you can have really super duper a lot of data points, and then you get very high resolution. You have more um, frequencies between zero and the Nyquist. Still, you can see it doesn't matter how many points you have in your time series, you can only ever go up to the Nyquist frequency. So if the sampling rate stays the same, the highest frequency you can reconstruct will always stay the same. And so, yeah, so in MATLAB, we uh, interpret this or we implement this as the function lint space, so linearly spaced numbers, always between zero, always between the Nyquist, um, and going up, and the number of steps corresponds to n over two plus one. I find that this is a uh, is a is a tricky and subtle point, and many students get confused about the difference between um, getting up to the to the sampling rate or the Nyquist frequency versus the number of uh, of uh, time points or your frequency resolution between zero and the Nyquist frequency. And so, because this is a tricky point, so we're going to have uh, so now I have this. Um, uh, MATLAB simulation that's going to, uh, I hope, uh, illustrate for you and, and, and show you very clearly what this distinction is and how these relate to each other. So what we're going to do is um, create uh, the same um, signal using different sampling rates of either 100 hertz or 1000 hertz, or you might also call this a kilohertz, and different time duration. So either, uh, well, here we list one second, 10 seconds, one second, but actually there's another second added on. So this is really going to be two seconds versus 11 seconds. Okay. And what we are going to do is um, construct a signal. So here I'm just defining the sampling rate for this iteration and the uh, time vector for this iteration. You can see we always start at minus one and then we go up to whatever is specified by this, uh, this uh, uh, vector up here. We are going to create a signal called a Morley wavelet. This is a real valued Morley wavelet. We are going to discuss Morley wavelets in much more depth in the next uh, section of these lectures where we talk about time frequency decomposition. But you should already be able to look at, at line 94 and see that there is a sine wave here, so it's 2 pi ft, and there is a Gaussian, so e to the minus t squared over something which is 2s squared. And uh, this produces a, uh, a Morley wavelet. Okay, but for now, the characteristics of the signal don't matter. We just want a, something to look at. So here we create the time domain version of the signal. And here we create the uh, frequency domain of the signal, or we compute the frequency representation of the signal. And this line 98 here, we are just um, uh, scale amplitude scaling the frequency representation just to make it uh, easier to look at. Okay, so now we can plot the time domain. So here's what a Morley wavelet looks like. Uh, you can see you can see the sine wave in there, and then there's the Gaussian tapering it. Um, so that's very nice. And here is the frequency representation. 
So the frequency representation of a Morley wavelet is a Gaussian, or I should say that the shape of a Morley wavelet in the frequency domain is a Gaussian. But again, I don't want to uh, focus on the, the shape uh, or the characteristics of this signal. What we really want to do is compare what happens when we make this same signal in the time domain and the frequency domain using these two different sampling rates and these two different periods of time. So first, let's zoom into the time domain signal. And what you can see is that the, the signals uh, represented by the, uh, the black circle and the uh, magenta stars are exactly the same. They have the same number of time points, so the same temporal resolution. That's not surprising. You see they both have the same sampling rate. And the blue signal is, follows the same, same shape. Uh, but it has many more time points, and this also, of course, makes sense because the sampling rate is much higher. So now they, they all look like they're overlapping uh, in this view, but in fact, if we were to move this signal over, you can see that the uh, the the uh, so the the yeah two of these signals are only two seconds long, so they stop here at one because it starts at minus one. And the signal represented by the uh, magenta stars is 11 seconds long, so this goes all the way out to 10. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward in the time domain. Now let's look at these um, <clears throat> functions again in the frequency domain. So here we see the Gaussian again, and now things look a little bit different because now it's the the signal represented by the, the blue dots, so the blue dots are unfortunately a bit difficult to see, but hopefully more clear in your screen. The blue dots and the black circles, those have overlapping uh, points in the frequency domain. And what those two um, signals have in common is that they have the same length. Notice that they have different sampling rates. So the sampling rate of the blue dots is 10 times higher than the sampling rate of the uh, black circles or the, the um, signal represented by the black circles, but they have the same amount of time and here in the frequency domain they have the same resolution. Um, but the signal represented by the uh, magenta star in contrast has many more um, points in the frequency domain so the frequency resolution is much higher even though the sampling rate is not higher. It's the amount of time that's higher. So the frequency resolution is actually a little bit different from how it works in the time domain. So here we see that the frequency resolution is determined not by the uh, not by the sampling rate, but by the number of time points, by the amount of total time that we have. And here you see also the difference between these signals. Um, these, uh, for the two signals that have a sampling rate of 100 hertz, they both stop at 50. And for the sampling, uh, for the signal that is sampled at 1,000 hertz, this with blue dots, then it goes all the way up to uh, 500 hertz, right? Because here is the Nyquist frequency of the signal represented by the blue dots, and here is the Nyquist frequency 50 hertz um, of the signals represented by uh, by uh, these other guys. Okay, so. This is a, a subtle but important point that the, um, the frequency resolution is not determined by the sampling rate. It is determined only by the number of time points that you have. What is determined by the sampling rate is the highest frequency that you can measure. So 50 hertz or 500 hertz for signals that were measured at uh, 100 hertz or 1 kilohertz. So if you find this still a little bit um, uh, unintuitive or, or a little bit uh, hard to grasp, then I encourage you to go through this simulation again and try changing these sampling rates and change the time durations and hopefully this will um, start making more intuitive sense to you. So it's, it's an important point and, and you don't want to um, uh, make mistakes in, in this because, um, because if you uh, don't get uh, this point then you will, then there's a risk that you will incorrectly construct this uh, vector of frequencies in hertz, and then you will completely be misinterpreting the frequency characteristics of the data. Okay, so now uh, Patrick McGowan is um, still on the prowl.
And he says, well, he accuses Fourier of being a cool man because he gives us only the frequency resolution that uh, we have available data for. And uh, but it turns out Fourier is, is not such a cool man. He says he can give us uh, more frequencies if we want, but we, we don't get more precision. He doesn't give us uh, better precision. We can increase the resolution of the Fourier transform, but not the precision. OK, and so uh, now Patrick McGowan's interest is piqued and he wants to know how this works. And Fourier says, well, this works by something called zero padding. So now let's talk a little bit about zero padding and the effect of zero padding on, on frequency resolution in the Fourier transform. So here we have a signal. Uh, and what we are going to do is zero pad this signal. So you can probably guess what zero padding means. It really means you, it just means that you pad the signal with a bunch of zeros. So in this case, we just tack on a bunch of zeros to the end of the signal. It's important to remember that whenever you zero pad in the Fourier transform, you always put the zeros at the end. You don't put the zeros in the beginning. You don't intermingle the zeros with the signal. All the zeros go at the end. So this is now an interesting um, concept because now we're getting more, uh, we have more data points in the time domain which means we are going to get a higher frequency resolution. We can extract more frequencies between zero and the Nyquist frequency. Um, but on the other hand, we haven't actually uh, added any information. So there's nothing new in this signal. We're just adding a bunch of zeros. We're not getting any more information out of the signal that we had before in this case, uh, but we are getting more frequencies. So this is how we can zero pad to increase the frequency resolution of the data, although we're not increasing the frequency precision of the data because we don't actually have any more information in the signal than what we started with. Okay, so now we can uh, see how this is going to work in MATLAB. So what I'm going to do now is, uh, so this is uh, just redefining the signal from, from the first section. What we're going to do is compute the Fourier transform of this signal and we're going to utilize the second input into the function FFT. And the second input is the n of the FFT, or the number of time points to use for the n for the uh, when computing the Fourier transform. Now, if you want to zero pad, so this is a useful um, uh, a useful input because it means that we don't need to zero pad manually. We don't need to take our signal and figure out how many zeros we want to add and just add them in like this. Instead, we take the, the actual signal that we have measured, and if we want to zero pad, we just add more numbers to the second input. So, but you do have to keep in mind that this input is the total length of the Fourier transform that you want to compute, not the number of um, zeros that you want to pad at the end. So if we were to do something like this, we see the signal is 14 points long, but here we are taking the FFT um, using an N of 10. This would actually mean that, that uh, MATLAB is going to truncate, is going to delete the last four points of the signal so that we get only 10 points. So this is not what we want. We want uh, the length of the signal and then plus however many zeros we want to pad at the end. Okay, so here we uh, compute the Fourier transforms of these three um, uh, well, it's the same signal, but just with uh, different zero padding. Here I define the frequencies vector. Now here I'm not specifying what the time unit is, so we, we don't know how to convert this into hertz. So instead I'm just leaving these frequencies vectors in terms of a fraction of the sampling rate. So uh, that means we always go from zero, and now here we're going to stop at 0.5, which is half of the sampling rate. So now we don't need to worry about uh, units. And you can see that what's going to differ between these three frequencies vectors is uh, whether it comes from the length of signal one, signal two, or signal three. Okay, so first let's uh, plot these signals in the time domain. And again, we're plotting in the time domain by taking the inverse Fourier transform. So you can see that the signals are all 
exactly the same for the first uh, 14 points. And then one of the signals stops here. The other signal where we zero padded 10 times, uh, or sorry, we zero padded uh, with uh, uh, 10 zeros. Uh, that stops here. And then the third signal where we zero padded with 100 zeros, that goes all the way out here to 114. So this is how it looks in the time domain. And now let's take a look at the frequency domain. So here in blue is the Fourier transform of the original signal. So I call it the native N. So this is just an N of uh, 14. This is the, these are the actual frequencies that we really truly have in the data that we can really measure. And you can see that as we add more um, zeros, as we add, uh, as we increase our n, the plot looks a little bit smoother going up to where we get um, uh, n plus 100, so we're zero padding by 100. Here it actually looks quite pretty. We have this nice smooth function and it seems like there are these kind of, uh, uh, yeah, very smooth, gentle hills in the in the Fourier transform. So you have to be careful when interpreting this because it's very uh, tempting to interpret this signal here as being uh, the you know 1.7 or 0.17 frequency component of the signal, but it's the interpretation of this point is a little bit more subtle because we do not actually measure this. Uh, component in the signal. In fact, this component does not exist in our signal because we don't have enough time points. This is just an estimate. This is the Fourier transforms um, guess at what this component in the signal might be if there were actually uh, data at that um, at that uh, frequency if we had enough time points. So you can also see it looks very smooth. In fact, it is uh, it is a sync interpolated signal. Um, and in fact, this is one of the ways of sync interpolating a um, signal just by taking the Fourier transform with a higher n. This is called, uh, I believe it's called the zero padding theorem that describes the relationship between um, zero padding a signal and, uh, and the sync interpolated version in the frequency domain. Okay, so why would you want to uh, zero pad the signal? There are three motivations, three reasons why you might want to zero pad your signal during the Fourier transform. One is if you want to obtain an estimate of a very specific frequency that you don't natively get from the, from the data because you don't have enough time points. The second um, is uh, the reason that will be used most often for time frequency analyses. And that is to match the lengths of the Fourier transforms um, for a signal on a kernel during the course of convolution. If you don't really understand what this means, don't worry about it. We will discuss this point when we talk about convolution in, in the near future. And finally, you can also zero pad just to uh, interpolate the results, just to make them look a bit smoother and a bit prettier. This is fine, it's a decent motivation, but just be careful to, um, to interpret the results correctly because these smoother plots are just sync interpolated, and you don't necessarily um, have the ability to to met. So these are just estimates of what the signal at that frequency might be if you had enough data. Okay, so I hope that was uh, useful, and I hope you enjoyed seeing Patrick uh, uh, McGowan uh, show his face again, and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.